Okay, good evening and welcome to the San Francisco Public Library. I'm Joan Jasper. I'm with the Department of Exhibitions and Public Programs. And thank you. Thank you. And welcome to our event tonight, Elect to Laugh with Will Durst. We're really excited to have Will here tonight. And this event is in connection with the exhibit called On the Clock, A Playful Guide to the Working Life. And this exhibit features selections from the Schmolowitz Collection of Wit and Humor, which is part of the San Francisco Public Library Collection. And this exhibit is on the sixth floor and will be on the sixth floor until May 31st. So I hope you all get a chance to go see it because it's a lot of fun upstairs. But right now, it's very much my pleasure to introduce to you Will Durst. The New York Times has called Will Durst, quite possibly, the best political comedian working in the country today. He writes a nationally syndicated humor column and is a frequent contributor to CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and Current TV. Although receiving five Emmy nominations and seven consecutive nominations for the American Comedy Awards Stand-Up of the Year, he has never won anything. <laughs> Not even a toaster. Yeah, imagine that. The all-American sport of bipartisan bashing was taken from the hit off-Broadway one-man show of the same name. And another book was made out of his last one-man show, Elect to Laugh, which ran for 41 weeks in San Francisco. His 800-plus television appearances include HBO, The Today Show, Letterman, Inside Politics, Good Morning America, Showtime, Comedy Central, and the CBS Morning News. Durst has been fired by the San Francisco Examiner twice, <laughs> by PBS three times, and he once ran for mayor of San Francisco, spending $1,200, pulling 2% of the vote, meaning on a dollar per vote basis, he is the mayor of San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, don't you wish it were true? So, and against all advice, he continues to put ketchup on his hot dog. Okay, obviously, Will Durst does not eat Chicago dogs. So, Will, sorry, you'll have a hard time at Wrigley Field, but I bet you'd be great on Rush Street, okay? So please help me welcome Will Durst. Yeah, those Chicago hot dogs with that weird neon green relish, that doesn't count. Not edible. How about a hand for Joan Jasper? And thank uh, you tens of people for coming down <laughs> on a Wednesday night. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be here. I, l I love the library. I think uh, the whole reading thing, uh, I think it's catching on. And uh, I think it's going to become a mainstay in American civilization someday. <laughs> Not now. Um, my name is Will Durst. I'm a political comedian. And uh, I've been here in San Francisco since 79. I, I moved here because comedy was illegal in Milwaukee, <laughs> which is where I'm from. It actu that's actually true. Uh, because when they wrote the municipal code for comics, uh, comics were MCs for strippers, like in the 50s. So they wrote them under the same code. So if you wanted to have stand-up comedy, you had to buy a new dancing license. So th exactly. So comedy was <laughs> illegal in Milwaukee. I moved here, and it wasn't uh, illegal, so it's much better for me. Uh, and also, San Francisco, I mean, it is my target demographic. It's people who read or know someone who does. Because <laughs> it's hard for me to do comedy clubs um, around the country. You know, I can do certain clubs like uh, D.C., or you know, I can go back to Milwaukee, maybe Chicago, uh, Seattle, Portland. But you know, there are some clubs they they don't want they don't want any uh, sarcasm or irony. They want their humor upfront and good natured, no hidden agendas, if you please. And uh, you know, and also, you know, I mean, look at me. I'm 61 years old. You know, the average age of a comedy club is 18 to 35, which was great when it was 18 to 35. Uh, but now I go into a comedy club and they stare at me like, why is this bitter old man lecturing me? So. <laughs> that for bitter old men? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm one of them. Um, 
But uh, this year is uh, the year after a presidential election, and my career kind of has a sine wave. You know, it's a presidential election, I do well, and then the year after, not so well. You know, I'm looking into jobs as greeters at Walmart. And uh, then next year is uh, a midterm, and then the year after that, they're already running, you know, for the following quadrennial year. So this is the down year where I'm just scampering for work. So whatever you got. Uh, no, really, yeah, because I, I've, I've created, I've patched together kind of a comedy quilt of a career. I got voiceovers and stand-up. I can't do just one thing. So um, uh, last year I did a Left to Laugh at the Marsh, and we ran. And last year everybody knew about the race. You know, the, the, oh, it was wonderful. What a cast of characters. Oh, my living God. Not just me. Even Pat Robertson said that the field of Republican candidates was too extreme. Pat Robertson said that, which is like having your drug intervention hosted by Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie Sheen is driving the van. Oh, but it, it, was, it was just wonderful. It was such, and they played, they played a, a game of Republican whack-a-mole because they hated Romney, so they, they, they tried every, everybody led the polls at one time. Palin, Trump, Bachman, Perry, Christie, Kane, Gingrich, Santorum, they all led the polls at one time. And then they finally went, oh, all right. And that's the problem with uh, being a political comedian. Uh, th this year's uh, a little, you know, it's a little spare. Uh, the, the, the landscape is, uh, you know, it's one of those late autumn, early winter landscapes, a uh, lot, of, lot of no leaves on the trees, you know, little sunlight, but last year, and, and that's the problem with being a political comic is that it is up and down and in and out and left and right, the whole Katy Perry song. I mean, sometimes there's nothing going on and I'm screwed, like now, you know? And the hard part, the real hard part is actually not writing the new stuff, it's getting rid of the old material. Because you get halfway decent at the bit, and you spend months, you know, crafting and and you know, just surgically striking a syllable or perfecting a gesture for a bit, and and then boom, you know, with political stuff, it's <laughs> starting to smell like bad milk, so you got to kick it out of the nest. For instance, my William Howard Taft material <laughs> doesn't have the same bite. <laughs> yeah, he got caught in the tub. He actually did. Uh, Reagan was great for comedy. Reagan was a... Uh, w well, part of it was Jimmy Carter. You couldn't do jokes about Carter because it was like kicking a puppy. You know, I mean, you, ooh, honey. Uh, but Reagan had a sense of humor about himself. Remember, he was shot. I didn't know he was shot. I don't know about you. I'd like a president with a central nervous system. <laughs> Single cell animal knows he's been injured. Paramecium go, mmm. <laughs> quail was, oh, quail, lush like a tropical rainforest. <laughs> Jay Danforth Quail, his biggest fear was that George Herbert Walker Bush would die in office and the next guy wouldn't keep him on as VP. <laughs> Biden. And that's why I need you guys, because I do that joke at a comedy club and it's, I get, like I, yeah, try to teach a dog chess or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and the worst part is the second show Friday, because every club, you know, second show Saturday, you know, they slept during the day, they get, maybe got a little later bedtime, but second show Friday, you know, they got up at six or seven, they started drinking after work. I get out at 12, and that's the average age of the crowd, and, <laughs> and invariably there's a, there's a, a, a bachelorette party, dead stage right, and there's one, you know, one of the eight 22-year-old girls is wearing a lace penis on her forehead, and, <laughs> and I'm trying to do jokes about raising the debt ceiling, and it's not fair to her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, the format of this little show is I'm going to do my little spiel, and then uh, you get the chances to ask questions later on. Nice. <laughs> Bill Glenn was great for comedy. He still is great for comedy. I mean, you saw him at the convention last year in Charlotte. I mean, he was great. He was, it was Bill back, full-throated, all his power 
Spirit, and he, and he just laid out the perfect reasons why we should reelect as president Bill Clinton. Um, <laughs> pretty much. Bill, I, I never had sexual relations with that woman. He was pointing at Helen Thomas. He meant that woman. <laughs> or Hillary Clinton, but he meant that <laughs> And then there was something that we in the business fondly refer to as the golden age of political comedy. For eight wonderful years, <laughs> George W. Bush was like a father to me. He was, I know he sucked for the country and the hemisphere and the planet and the solar system and the universe, but for me, he was pure gold. He was like if Reagan and Quayle had a kid. <laughs> He was Quagan, <laughs> a Wheel of Fortune president in a Jeopardy world. I always carry these, uh, these three of my five cards with me, you know, and I take little notes and stuff. And oh, good. Um, I need this one. Um, at the end of uh, Bush's second term, I had two, two three by five cards, both sides, full of verbatim quotes from Bush. I didn't embellish a syllable. Just. Just pure quotes. One was, I think we can all agree the past is over. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite was, the problem with the French is they don't have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make stuff up like this. <laughs> Obama is tough. Obama is tough. There's, there's no scandals. There's, there's not the hint of a whisper of a shadow of a scintilla of a scandal. I mean, he, you know, uh, Clinton was a corpulent womanizer. Bush had the, the DUIs and, and the DTs and, and the STDs and the ADHD. And, and Obama is smooth. He's like, he's like chamois on chrome. He's got less friction than rayon pajamas on silk sheets and zero gravity. <laughs> Makes Clinton look like a chunk of concrete wrapped in Velcro, dipped in wallpaper paste. <laughs> no matter what you think of Barack Obama's policies, you got to admire his ability not to get involved in them. <laughs> Funny, we got every persuasion here. You know? People laughing and people shaking their heads. And and that's one of the things that I love about Barack, is he pisses off everybody. <laughs> he does, he pisses off the progressives, they thought he was a progressive, only because, you know, he was, he was being compared to George W. Bush. <laughs> John McCain looked progressive at that point, you know? And so the progressives, they're wearing their, their disappointment like the dented chainmail returning crusaders, you know? <laughs> no, he didn't pass the rainbows in every pantry act. And meanwhile, you listen to the right, and he's, he's this radical jihadist trying to drag America into the socialist sinkhole that is Canada. <laughs> so one side sees him as Malcolm X, and the other side, Urkel. <laughs> no, he's, he's a facilitator. He always brought people together. And the Republicans, you know, for the last for four and a half years, their negotiating stance with Obama is, no, 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 ah, no, sir, no way, not a million years, let me think, no, I'll sleep on it, no. What are you, four? <laughs> of course, the Republicans are an actual party, you know, I mean, the Democrats are useless. I'd rather have terracotta warriors on my side. <laughs> At least they're all facing the same direction. <laughs> That, see, that's, it's like the problem with Occupy. I believed in Occupy when it, w when it, was, when it was on Wall Street. But see, the, the very definition of the term liberal means accepting of many viewpoints. So that's the problem. You, you can't focus here. You talk about corporate greed and, and income inequality, and, and you set up an encampment, and then the global warming people show up, and oh, all right, you can be over here. And then the free Tibet people want to want a tent, and then the, 
the hemp contingent wants to hold an intermediate hacky sack class. And, and uh, the dolphin free tuna people show up. And once you let them in, you gotta let the tuna free dolphin people in. No judgment. And then the, the homeless show up because the reggae cl club is handing out brownies. So, I mean, it dissipates. And that's, of course, the Republicans have de evolved into a single cell amoeba. They become the tax cut zombies from the planet. No. And all, and all the tax cuts go to the wealthy. Does that make any sense? Dude, you're giving money to the rich. The rich have money. <laughs> that's why they're rich. Give some money to the poor. Give the rich a hug. Who wants a government hug? <laughs> and then they always pull out some sort of pointy-headed economist from the Heritage Foundation. Well, obviously, you're unfamiliar with the complexities of supply-side economics. The deal is we give the money to the rich, and then they spend it, and it trickles downward to the poor. No, they're not going to spend it. They're going to hang on to it. That's how they got rich. <laughs> You give us poor money, I guarantee we will blow every damn penny we get our grubby little hands on. Why do you think we're poor? Because we spent all our money. We'd be happy to do it again. Uh, just give us half the chance. And of course, they, you know, they just try to get, get the whole the yeah, diversion thing, and they're like magicians, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the, you know, oh, he was, he was born in Kenya. Oh, what was that? No, he wasn't. He was born in Honolulu, in a manger. We all know that. <laughs> and then he was visited by the three Haoles, who <laughs> presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and puka shells from Hilo Hattie. I mean, it doesn't matter what he does. They can't give him any credit for any victory. They blame him for everything. They can't, you know, they criticize Michelle Obama for her anti-obesity program. For Christ's sake, who's pro-obesity? <laughs> the Husky Casket Corporation? <laughs> Angioplasty balloons are us? <laughs> Wisconsin Tourism Board? <laughs> Don't oom me on that. I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> Anybody else from Wisconsin, you can oom me, but my ants are huge. <laughs> they are immense behemoth Wisconsin women. They have their own gravitational force. Honest to God, they, they used to be ordinary bipeds. You would see them on the street, you would not mistake them for anything but a humanoid. But no, just. You go into the kitchen before Thanksgiving dinner, the entire spice rack is in a complex, continuous orbit around their bodies. <laughs> Not buying it. I love going back to Wisconsin. And I always think, you know, because it's a little slower there, and your friends, that you had friends 30 years ago, they're still there. And they're still friends with other friends. And here, you know, boom, everything changes so fast. Especially in San Francisco, you know. And, and me, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I don't live in the real world. I live in San Francisco. I'm married to another comedian. And we don't have kids. I mean, I'm still living in college. <laughs> I am. I am. Our house is a mess, but there's always beer in the fridge. Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> So, I mean, this is not a town. This is a 49 square mile circus in search of a tent. That's what <laughs> San Francisco is. <laughs> and, and I love it because we don't care who you are. You know, that's, that's why I go back to Milwaukee and after a week, you know, I'm thinking, you know, the, the pace of life here is so, and then I'll be in a bar and some guy would be screaming at a TV for 180 degrees of why I would be screaming at the TV. And, I realize I could die in a bar fight here. <laughs> and, I, and I love that about San Francisco, that we're the petri dish of social change. You, we are. Everything starts here. And not, not just good things start here. <laughs> a couple of bad things, a little overreach here, but all the good stuff starts here. The no smoking thing, the, the paper thing, you know, the plastic bag thing. Yeah. We are, sometimes, you know, it can be a little too much, this town, 
I mean, sometimes you just want a cheeseburger. You don't need it covered in a mango chutney aioli <laughs> for $24. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lovely roasted sun-dried tomato basil reduction. In the Midwest, we call it ketchup. <laughs> but it's true. We don't care who you are. We don't judge you based on what color or creed or sexual identity. We judge you based on the important thing what kind of car you drive and are unable to park. <laughs> in San Francisco, you could be a red-bearded Lithuanian vegan dwarf in the golden showers. Come on down. <laughs> Water's fine. We get a street festival for that. <laughs> and I love it. I do. I, I, I'm confused by this town to this day. I live in the Sunset District. You can never see the damn sunset because of the fog. Might as well be called the Unicorn District. <laughs> San Francisco Mime Troop talks. <laughs> San Francisco where Halloween is redundant. <laughs> it's hard being an old guy here though, you know. 61, I mean, you become invisible. You really do. I don't know if you've tried going into a coffee shop and uh, just just making a joke with the barista. They, they fr barista, that's what you still call it. Coffee store clerk, no, a barista. Uh, but they flip out. It's like the furniture walked up and tried to initiate a conversation. Ah, ah do you speak? You know, I mean, it's. And, and the tattoos, I understand the tattoos, because every generation has to plant your identity there, you know what I mean? <laughs> and we had the long hair and uh, the blue jeans, you know? But uh, I don't think the kids understand the tattoos. You know, a decision made at the age of 18 in a questionable state of sobriety is not necessarily known for its longevity. <laughs> the canvas deteriorates. That cute little butterfly could grow up to be a pterodactyl. <laughs> the unicorn prancing on a rainbow is now a rhinoceros entombed in a striated bog. <laughs> <laughs> and the noises you make at the age of 61 are incredible. <laughs> I mean, some of the noises are, you know, your old man noises getting out of a chair, you know. Ugh, ugh. <laughs> the jingling of the change in your pocket, the, the master scratching of your balls, which I never knew. For years I heard my dad do this. I had no idea that's what that was about. <laughs> and the words that come out of your mouth. Words that you swore would never pass your lips because, yes, back in my day. No! I would rather nail my tongue to a red-hot banister to ever have any kid hear me say back in my day. But that's what happens. You hang out with, with your friends, you know, other old people, or as we call ourselves, the chronologically gifted. <laughs> and what do you talk about? You talk about uh, the politics, you know, who died, real and imaginary. I can't believe they killed Matthew. You know, they talk about which body parts don't work anymore. You talk about, you know, typical stuff. And then suddenly somebody will say, you know what the problem with the kids today is? They got it too easy. Back in my day, no! <laughs> bottle of water, we didn't have bottled water. Why are they so thirsty? Are they on drugs? <laughs> we wanted to hydrate, we drank right out of the hose. <laughs> seat belts, we didn't have the seat belts, we had the arm. <laughs> Detroit will never replicate the tensile strength of your mother's arm. <laughs> cell phones? What do you need? I used a cell phone once. It was a phone in a cell. <laughs> Took 20 minutes to dial with a rotary dial. Uh, had to remember the number, and it had a word in it. <laughs> we didn't have caller ID. The phone rang, you had to answer it. It was like emotional roulette. I'm sure it started with our parents. You know, our parents did it to us. 
<laughs> school buses, we had to walk to school. Three miles, barefoot, through the snow, over broken glass, uphill, both ways, in the dark, with poisonous bats pecking at our eyes. <laughs> I'm sure it's, this song has been sung since the dawn of time, you know, the caveman. Wheel, we didn't have no fancy schmancy wheel to play with. We had clumps of dirt and sticks and rodent skulls we were happy to have. <laughs> Of course, there's some good sides to getting old. There are, there's bright sides. Yes, there is. Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> uh, I can't read it, that's a problem. Oh, okay. And you gotta do the mouth thing too, you know. The creaks of your bones keep you alert while driving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 all right, all right, all right. All right. Uh, nobody cares when you clip a hash pipe to your walker. <laughs> Still get to do drugs, only now there's a copay. <laughs> <laughs> only nine books in your library. Read them in order and then start over. <laughs> There's always one ear hair long and thick enough <laughs> that you can cut cheese with it. Uh, your nipple rings can double as belt loops. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny's going like that. Huh? <laughs> I'm so, so glad that uh, Barack Obama won the presidency, except for my career, because Mitt Romney would have been wonderful. I mean, he ran the worst campaign ever. And that includes France in 39 and New Coke. <laughs> it was, he, was, he was an awful, awful candidate. He lost to a black guy whose middle name is Hussein in a lousy economy. And his staff kept saying, oh, you know, the long campaign made him a better candidate. No, it didn't. Problem was, all he did for six years was run for presidency. I don't think his learning curve had any more bendy parts. <laughs> he had the charisma of a plastic picnic fork with three of the tines snapped off. <laughs> I think he was electile dysfunctional. I really do. You would see him at his own rallies and he was uncomfortable. I mean, he would shake his hands at his own rallies. Under his breath, you could hear, icky, 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 icky. <laughs> you know there was an aid with a pure oil hand sanitizer attached to a 55-gallon drum hosing him down. Goes to Great Britain and pisses off the entire country. Great Britain, that's not one of the tough ones, people. <laughs> 47% of Americans are moochers and malingerers, and that pissed off his base, you know. 47%, hell, that's more than half. <laughs> of course, he did good in that first debate. It, well, 70 million Americans tuned into that debate. Unfortunately, President Obama was not among them. <laughs> and I think one of the problems was that he, Romney was so good at shifting, you know? Say what you will about the man, he, he was, he felt strongly about both sides of many issues. <laughs> he was like one of those plastic wind tube dancers you see on the sides of used car lots. <laughs> That's killing me. No, 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 I don't want your pity. And, that, and then, of course, the vice presidential debate, where Joe Biden, uh, oh, oh, she left. But Joe Biden turned into a laughing Sal from Playland. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> frightening small children. And the, and the vice presidential debate was the first debate after the first presidential debate. So they needed Biden to stem the bleeding 
And he did. And it was dangerous because, you know, he's not just a loose cannon. He's, he's, he's a loose aircraft carrier. So. <laughs> and then I'm Paul Ryan, a bold choice. That's what they get called for. He's a bold choice. Really? <laughs> Maybe, but bold, not always synonymous with good. Whiskey for breakfast is a bold choice. <laughs> Forehead dragon tattoo is incredibly bold. Passing an 18-wheeler on a blind curve, doing 80 in the rain. Really, really bold. <laughs> of course, he's the budget guru, Paul Ryan. You know. That's what they call him, the budget guru of the GOP, which you know, should be an oxymoron. <laughs> But in both of his budgets, all three of his budgets, uh, he, and he names them, he gives them cute little names, Pathway to Prosperity, Roadmap to the American Future. But in all of his, uh, all of his budgets, he replaces Medicare with vouchers. <laughs> coupons, healthcare coupons. <laughs> Why? I, I guess old people love coupons. <laughs> I got a coupon! <laughs> Only four more we can book an anesthesiologist. <laughs> Only three for Kaiser. <laughs> and then we phase in early bird organ transplants. <laughs> Somehow get Groupon involved. <laughs> get 55% off your designer colonoscopy, but we have to sell 600 by 4 p.m., so tell your friends. <laughs> days in the first quarter, so 93 days, so uh, 93 from 365 is 272, in 272 days, health care will be the law of the land, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And I'm glad, I am, I mean look at me, I'm a schmuck comic. That's what I do. You know, I drop little chuckle pellets and hamlets all over this grand land of ours. It's, it's not like I, I'm, a, I'm an employee of the SFPL or I belong to the Comics, Clowns, and Jesters Union. I'm not a member of Congress. So I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you caught that. I just, I just that. I'm glad healthcare passed. I mean, I understand why people are upset. And, and nervous and leery. I mean, the bill is 2,400 pages long or 2,700. They're still not sure. Shouldn't be you sure? A lot of stuff can happen in 300 pages. I've, I've, I've read Harry Potter. <laughs> I still think the third book was the best. Prisoner of Azkaban. Because, come on, yeah, I mean, <laughs> in the seventh book, he kills Voldemort by talking him to death. I mean, jeez. <laughs> Hashtag spoiler alert. <laughs> but I think the sheer length of the bill is what, uh, is what freaked people out. You know, it's what uh, got everybody upset. Uh, it's why Congress, you know, the, the Republicans tried to demonize, this bill is provisions to kill the elderly. And Democrats didn't immediately go, no, 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 no. Because they weren't sure. Also, the guy holding the sign, stop socializing America and hands off my Medicare. Dude, <laughs> that's two different signs. <laughs> I wonder why this guy's so opposed to public health care. Well, look, at, he's obviously been <laughs> betrayed by the public education system. <laughs> and they think they're gonna pay for it with a series of sin taxes. And you know what a sin tax is. That's where they fine you for using a hyphen when an ellipsis was called for. No, 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 no. But I always wanted to do that in a library. No. Uh, <laughs> no, it's when they, uh, they penalize you for being a bad person. It's a tax on tobacco and liquor and fast food. And I gotta be honest, that's me. I smoke and I drink and I eat red meat and I know I'm, no, I'm a bad, bad man. But I'm not stupid. I'm down to four or five cigarettes a day. Mostly because I live in San Francisco. You know. Is that a cigarette? No, it's a joint. Well, it better be. <laughs> uh, so we're 35 minutes in. Uh, I guess. Uh, any questions? Anybody? Anything? Yes, way back there. 
What about the protest tonight at Obama's fundraiser down the street at the Gettys? Oh, is he at the Gettys? Yeah. What's the protest about? The Keystone Pipeline. Keystone Pipeline. Are you against it? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. <laughs> the protesters are against it. Oh, sorry, Joan, I didn't give you. Joan Jasper, everybody. Yeah. She's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are taping this, and we're going to put it on our website. So if you have a question, I'll run around and get and get the microphone to you. Okay? Yay, Joan. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a question right here, sir. What, what, what is your take on the board of supervisors passing an anti-nudity law, except for the uh, baby bay race? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the things I love about San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> It is. I mean, have you seen the naked guys when they were wandering on? And, and it was, you know, we're adults and we don't care. And and they they do drive you nuts, though. I mean, I was I was because uh, it's not just hanging out in one area. You know, I mean, there's free range naked people. And, uh, there, are, there are. I saw. I'm down at the Embarcadero on a Sunday morning, and there's a naked guy on roller skates. Sunday morning. I had a late Saturday night. It's like nine in the morning. It's before nine, because I had to do an interview at KJO at nine. And I'm and I'm getting out of my car and there's a naked guy in roller skates. And, and I'm oh, dude, Jesus, no. I, I didn't ask him if he was involved in an Easter egg hunt. I didn't uh, No, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they were camouflaged brown. Um, and and he's and he wants me to do something. I'm oh Jesus! So he and he's pissed and he and he shoots past me and he's on roller skates. So there's centrifugal motion and slapping noises and oh. <laughs> and I've been down at that little. Um, Parklet that they created at Castro and Market, you know, that little triangle park, and now you can't go down 17th anymore, and there's trees and benches, and there were always naked guys there, and, and not like, you know, 15 or 20, always two or three, always wearing, you know, baseball caps because they're worried about sunburn up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the, this two and a half feet, you know, is <laughs> the UV rays can't make it down there. And, but there's always a couple there, and the tourists are, you know, gassed, and they all pretend to be shocked, but then, you know, take a lot of pictures. And, <laughs> and it's a gaggle of naked people. I, I don't know what you call the, the, you know, the plural of naked people. I don't know if it's a, not a gaggle. It's uh, maybe a dangle. You know. <laughs> Definitely not a pride. <laughs> Perhaps a lamentation like of lark. <laughs> or exaltation of swans, but... And you know, the problem was they, they were getting hungry and hanging out and they go in the restaurants or the 7-Eleven and there was no municipal code against being naked so you couldn't kick them out. And the merchants are going, oh, come on, naked people, rest food, naked, you know. So wiener. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I should be, uh, uh, we need a little more uh, background here. Supervisor wiener. <laughs> And if you're, if you're in politics and your name is Wiener, I mean, you get to choose how other people pronounce your name. You know, you, you could have done the Boner Boehner thing. <laughs> Speaker of the House, John Boehner has 11 brothers and sisters. They're all boners. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. His mother's a boner. His father, well, 12 kids, you do the math. <laughs> Can, can you do this on the yeah, SFPO? Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, you're good. You're good. So, so Wiener passed the first law. It was a stopgap law that if you're naked and you went into a restaurant, you had to bring your own towel to sit on. It was known alternatively as the Arthur Dent solution <laughs> and the skid marks law. <laughs> That's what it became known as, the skid, uh, Wiener skid marks law. <laughs> But that's, you know, people, naked people restaurants, so then he just said no. And I agree with him. 
Because they're not going to bust anybody unless you go into a restaurant, unless somebody complains. And nobody on the street's going to go. You know, so that's, I don't, yeah, I don't care. Just interesting, you know, <laughs> how it came to be. <laughs> but that's what I love about San Francisco. You know, we don't care. Sir. Well, thank you for your humor. <coughs> we do appreciate it. And then uh, my thought, if the question is, what do you think about airlines charging now by weight? It just started <laughs> yesterday. Are you Samoan? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. Well, it's Air Samoa. <laughs> and listen, if I got Tui Asasopo on the plane, you know, I ain't charging him the $39, I'm charging him the 78 So I don't know if anybody else is going to pick that up. I can see Air Samoa doing it. <laughs> yes. And did you see that today uh, o Obama came out with a brain brain mapping? $100 million spent on brain mapping. And already, Republicans have, you know, they, they have their anti-brain denier people. <laughs> <you know. laughs> and they, they, they gave themselves a name. They call themselves the GOP. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I would love your thoughts on America's Cup coming to San Francisco and how much money we're spending on this sport for billionaires so other billionaires can watch. You know, San Francisco gets involved in these sports and America's Cup, you know, <laughs> you know how do you <laughs> they're off. <laughs> Four hours later, they're back. <laughs> really a sport for billionaires. And now, because of the worldwide recession, not enough billionaires, apparently. So instead of 18 different teams, now we're down to three. <laughs> well, how many teams? We have 18 different international teams and bringing crews of 500,000 people each. So that's 18, that's 9 million extra people will be in. How many people are coming? Three. <laughs> but at least we get a. A, a terminal, a cruise ship terminal out of it. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I think the, the concerts should disturb the people on Telegraph Hill as much <laughs> as we get disturbed out in the Sunset District. <laughs> so, and they're all, the Richmond is, yeah, you, you poor guys. Especially, what do you live on, Fulton or something? Fulton, oh, baby, oh, I apologize, yeah. yeah. And I never go to any of those concerts. Have you ever been to, uh, what is it, Outland? My God, I'm an adult, I can't do <laughs> so. Are there any other questions? No. And the free one, what's the free one? Oh, Warren Hellman's, uh, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Uh, could you just uh, talk about our local banker? Who is head Which one? Of, um, Wells Fargo, and the fact that he makes $22 million a year. <laughs> or could you just talk about Oh, I think that's good. I, yeah, I, I think that's good that he makes that much money. Yeah, because uh, when the revolution comes and we break into his house, we'll be able to portion off everybody in San Francisco will get forty cents, <laughs> and I want my forty cents. Yeah, I think the in incoming inequality is. Uh, you know, I'm a third generation factory rat from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My my grandpa worked at Alice Chalmers. My dad, my mom, my stepmom, uh, various cousins, and uh, the whole town was named after Alice Chalmers. We had a town. It was West Milwaukee, uh, and Alice Chalmers were merged together. Uh, the name of the town was West Alice, so it was named after, I mean, it was so important to that community. And that's, and I think at the time that the chairman of Alice, uh, I think he was making maybe 20 times what the average, you know, wage worker was making, and now it's like 3,000 times, and it's it's just not right. It's not right for any of them. B of A, bunch of assholes. And I'm, uh, I'm sure I can't say that on, on television. And I, I apologize. But there's got to be a, there's got to be a way, dude. Just yell it out.
And then, the, and then the people who were in charge of bringing them to trial quit and then go to Wall Street and make, yeah, 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 it's, uh, yeah. And uh, why, why didn't we prosecute Nixon? And why didn't we prosecute Bush? And, and you gotta feel sorry for Bush, you know? I mean, you know, Cheney, you know how Cheney got his gig? He was in charge of the vice presidential search committee for Bush. And then, hey, well, best guy in the room, me! <laughs> So Cheney's the, the true lizard. <laughs> he is, yeah, but you know, he, and, and the thing is, nobody thinks they're the bad guy. You know, nobody in their mind thinks that they're, they all think that they're doing good for either America, and, and that's how they, you know, I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning and looks in the mirror and goes, how deep of a reeking heap of steaming feces can I lay today, you know? <laughs> Everybody, even Hitler had a girlfriend, you know, I mean, nobody, Nobody thinks they're the bad guy. So, uh, well, yeah, San Francisco, you know, where they protest Nancy Pelosi. I mean, they don't understand that around the, the, the nation that Nancy Pelosi is the evil leftist demon, you know, with the horns. And then we have people here saying, she's not evil enough. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and she's not. <laughs> she's not, because we need that pendulum swing. We need somebody, it's like Michael Moore, say sometimes, you know, he's a little off, off, the, you know, <laughs> you know, but he is the pendulum swing to Rush Limbaugh, and we, you need that, and you need somebody to be the pendulum swing for Cheney, and it's not Kucinich. Yeah. <laughs> Ma'am? <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't let me in that room. Oh, uh, sure. Thank you very much for being here tonight. It's absolutely delightful. Oh, for sure. Yes. Um, I would like to know about what your take is on the NRA's recommendation to have armed guards in school. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, what's, what's my answer to shootings in school? More guns! <laughs> I can't believe that we have... I can't believe they have so much power that the NRA has so much power. And, and uh, don't get me wrong, here's the pendulum swing in action. You know, I, I think that NRA has legitimate gripes and then they fly off the rails, you know, just because they're so worried about, but you know, assault weapons, I mean, come on. Just a couple of years ago, they understood and, they're, and th now their feet are being held, to, I don't know. It, uh, the assault weapons can be used as a legitimate hunting rifle as well, I can see. I can see your logic, of course, you can also use a chainsaw to cut butter. <laughs> if you think about it, a hand grenade will signal the end of recess. <laughs> you can light a cigarette off of a <laughs> flamethrower. <but. laughs> and and uh, now they're so powerful that they've, s they've squashed any research about gun violence. You can't even do research about it. And uh, yeah, so I think you know, if Wayne, P if Wayne LaPierre were shot in the head, you know, <laughs> that would be a horrible thing. Horrible thing, but <laughs> poetic justice. <laughs> no, I did a gig with Charlton Heston one time. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, uh, like the editorial cartoonist convention, and I was a speaker, and he was a speaker, and uh, it was in Minneapolis. It was right near the end, and... And uh, he was taking them to task because they were always using him as the figurehead. Uh, yeah, he was <laughs> not very collegial. Yeah, but he knew he was in an adversarial uh, atmosphere. So he read his little thing. He had a teleprompter. He couldn't. He that was part of the deal. He had to have a teleprompter. He did his thing. He flew into Minneapolis. Went to the hotel. Did his thing off the teleprompter. Flew out of Minneapolis. Uh, uh, Mr. Heston, Mr. Heston, Mr. Heston. <laughs> well, that's freaky. But see, I have the same problem with PETA that I do with the NRA. You know, the people with the ethical treatment of animals. I mean, dressing up in giant fish costumes, going to elementary schools, and terrorizing the kids. Don't eat fish. Fish have feelings too. Oh, for Christ's sake. What feelings do fish have? Wet, cold, ow. That's it. <laughs> Fish eat fish! Fish eat fish! 
<laughs> that, that was almost like a song. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, sir. Right here. Sense the microphone. What do you think about our current mayor? <laughs> you know, I heard him speak, and he's remarkably lucid. He, I think he's, re I, I think he's very smart, and that's not the impression I've been getting in the press. And yet, I, I heard him talk at like, a, uh, you know, with Chuck Reed, mayor of San Jose, and I think uh, Gavin was there. And uh, uh, well, I, I'm also prejudiced because I worked with Willie Brown. I had a radio show with Willie Brown for a year, and yeah, and I and I know people love or hate Willie Brown, but man, he is, he is good. He is smooth. I mean, he's the only guy I know who can enter a revolving door behind you and come out first. Uh, he is. <laughs> I don't. But he's smart too. And uh, and uh, Gavin, you know, I see Gavin all the time at these little things, and he pretends to remember who I am, but you know he doesn't. And uh, you know, hi, how you doing? Good to see you, sport or tiger or something. You know. <laughs> so he's got that nickname. But uh, the thing that I love about Gavin was that, uh, you know, when he was running for governor against Jerry Brown, and then he didn't have the money, but during that little brief six-week period, someone asked him, well, why don't you run for lieutenant governor? And <laughs> he was so candid. He said, uh, you know what? I don't even know what the job entails. <laughs> and then, so he's perfectly qualified <laughs> to be lieutenant governor of the state of California. And uh, so I think, um, I think Mr. Mr. Ed Lee, and uh, how many times do you get a mayor with five letters in his name? That is so brief, <laughs> so succinct. Yeah, I, th I think he's doing a good job. And, uh, and he's keeping the ego out of it. You know, he's able to do that. I'm a big Hillary fan. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, the next 2016. I'm hoping it's Clinton Bush, you know, because I get all these old jokes. You know, <laughs> that I that I hope to bring back, because Jeb is threatening to run, <laughs> and I have I'm working on this bit. I'm doing a little show at uh, the Marsh, and this is mostly for the television. Uh, <laughs> doing a show at the Marsh. It's called Boomer Aging, and from LSD to OMG. <laughs> And it's about being a baby boomer and getting old and some of the stuff that I did earlier, isn't it? But I'm doing a bit about Nixon and how, uh, you know, when I, was, when I was born in 1952, Nixon ran for vice president and he won, and then he, 56, he ran for vice president and he won, and then in 60, he ran for president and he lost, and then in 62, he ran for governor of California and he lost, and he said, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore, and he lied. And then, <laughs> then in 68, he ran for president, uh, saying that he had a secret plan to end Vietnam, and he lied, <laughs> but he won. And then in 72, Nixon won. And then in uh, 73, Spiro Agnew resigned, and, and Nixon appointed his successor. And then in 74, Nixon resigned, and his successor that he appointed, Nixon's shadow jumped in, and then in 76, bicentennial year, the, the Nixon shadow that he appointed ran and lost to Jimmy Carter, who was like a Southern JFK without a spine, and then in 1980, the Southern JFK without a spine lost to Ronald Reagan, who thought he was Nixon in a movie. And then <laughs> 1984, the guy who thought he was Nixon in a movie won by the biggest landslide ever, and then in 1988, George H.W. Bush, who was the guy who thought he was Nixon in a movie's carbon copy, ran, and he won. And then in 1992, the guy who thought he was Nixon in a movie's carbon copy ran and lost to Bill Clinton, who was kind of like a Southern JFK with a spine. <laughs> And then in 1996, the Southern JFK with a spine beat Bob Dole, who was Nixon's palace guard dog. <laughs> and then in 2000, the guy who thought he was Nixon in a movie's carbon copies, son, George W. Bush, ran. And then in 2004, the guy who thought he was Nixon in a movie's carbon copies, son, won re-election. And then in 2008, the black JFK with a spine ran and won. And in 2016, it's going to be 
the guy who thought he was Nixon in a movie's car and copies, other son, Jeb, <laughs> versus the southern JFK with part of a spine's wife, Hillary. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on. <laughs> so it doesn't get any laughs, but it gets applause if I get it. <laughs> so that'll be in Boomer Agent. And it's every Tuesday at the Marsh. Any other questions? The lady back there. You know what happened when I moved here in 1979, November 4th, 1979, and I remember that date because November 4th, 1974 was my first time on stage with an actual act. And November 4th, 1981, I got married, so everything seems to happen on November 4th. But I moved to San Francisco, I immediately started working, and then 1980, 81, comedy clubs started, because there were only, in 1980, there were 12 comedy clubs in the entire country, in the entire country. There were two in LA, there were two in San Francisco, there were two in New York, there were two in Chicago, uh, and then there might have been one or, you know, there may have only been eight, okay? You know, I might be overstating the case. And in 1990, 10 years later, there were 440 comedy clubs in the country. Knoxville, Tennessee had three full-time clubs. Knoxville, Tennessee. And, and cable created that, because HBO started, I think, in 76 or something, and they, they had Carlin and, um, something called On Location, and it was the first comedy. And then they discovered how cheap comedy was. You don't have to pay writer's fees. You don't have to pay music rights. It's, comics are self-contained, so they could hire us. We would write our own material. You know, they just have a host, and the comic could be the host. And so they started putting comedy on cable. And I know this is true because the last two towns in America to have comedy clubs were the last two towns in America to get cable. <laughs> and they were Cincinnati and Milwaukee. And I was intimately involved in both of those two towns. So I followed that. And they were the last two towns to get. And then in San Francisco, we had 14 full-time clubs within a 90-mile radius. There were two in Sacramento. There were and you could, you could work each club twice a year. So boom, for me, that's 28 weeks. So I stayed here and I just, and I didn't move to LA. And they didn't want to hear political stuff in LA. You know, they wanted you to do your, they were worried about so many things. They, they were worried about time dating. They didn't, they didn't want to time date or, you know, stamp a, a time into the, they wanted to use it. You would sign, when you started out and you go on TV, they pay you 400 bucks and they run it and run it and run it. And there's a little writer that comics talk about. There's always this writer, throughout the universe in perpetuity. <laughs> That's what you sign when they, w if you want that check, if you want to go on TV. So if they discover life on Jupiter and they're comedy fans, <laughs> you still don't get another residual. <laughs> but there was something about comedy in the early 80s, and San Francisco is known as kind of the left bank of that era, and because all the comics who came out of here, Paula Poundstone, Bobby Slayton, uh, so many, yeah, so many wonderful names. Rob, Robin was actually earlier, Robin was late 70s. Robin pushed through before there were stages. I mean, he, he really was a pioneer. I'm sorry, uh, Kevin Meany, uh, Bob Sarlat, yeah, there was, Barry Sobel. There were so many comics. And comics at the time, in the in around the 80s, comics were like square pegs and round holes. We didn't do it because we thought there was money. There was no money in it. You you did comedy because you had to. So you had some you had some incredible characters. And I I still uh, my wife and I my wife was much funnier than I am, which pisses me off, not less than <laughs> somewhat. But she's an improviser, and she always, she's a comedy floozy. She's been in every group. She guested with the committee when she was still in high school, and, and she was with the wing, and, and she was with uh, 
uh, Comedy Underground and Femprov and uh, National Theater of the Deranged and Spaghetti Jam and, and Holy City Zoo Play. I mean, she's, yeah, she's just a comedy floozy. So she's been around. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but comedy, comedy was like verbal jazz. I mean, the people who came to the comedy clubs in the early 80s were people who went to rock and roll in the 60s and 70s, but they got, they got old enough that they wanted to sit down and hear the lyrics. <laughs> and that's what, that's what stand-up comedy was. We, we, it was verbal jazz, and we were just, and it was in, in the late 80s, you would go into a comedy club and there was an electricity. I mean, and part of that was all the radio shows, Alex Bennett show created a little mini stellar system, in, in the, but you would go and the people were excited to be in a comedy club, and they would pay money to get into that comedy club. And then someone discovered you didn't have to charge a cover, that all you needed to do was fill the room and you could make enough money on the $4 Coronas by setting a two drink minimum. So they started throwing out passes to people, free passes to get into the comedy club. And, and the cachet of the comedy club just boom, went down and then and then the idea was not who was the best comic or who was pushing the art form, it was who was selling the most beer and, you know, when they appeared. So, I mean, it all changed in those 10 years. An evening at the Improv went from once a week to four times a day, and so they were scraping the bottom of the barrel. But, man, the early 80s, it was, it was like, yeah, it was, it was a plowing new field, you know. And, uh, and also, you got to remember, that the baby boomers had that magic window between 1962 and the introduction of the birth control pill and 1983 with the discovery of AIDS. So you think of that. We hit our we hit prime time puberty during that magic window where everybody got laid. <laughs> everybody in the world got laid. Uh, 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 Henry Kissinger got laid. Ernest Borgnine got laid. George Herbert Walker Bush got laid. Everybody got, and that was going on. And then cocaine reared its ugly head. And then money, money came in. And so, yeah, but before that was a community in San Francisco. Uh, you, you guys were treated, and I was lucky enough to be part of it. Where do you think you're headed now? Oh, it's all cyclical. It's, uh, the kids come in and, the kids come in and they change it. You know, it's much more confessional now. And it's more about me and being part of the, you know, the community. Oh, there's there's so many good comics out there. Always always love Stephen Wright. I still think Bobby Slayton is one of the pure, best pure stand-ups. I love Louis Black. Um, not a big fan of the guy on HBO. Um, there's so many. Greg Proops might be the funniest human on the face of the planet. No, but they put in their chops. And if you notice all those TV shows that lasted, you know, like Tim Allen and, and Robin and all those shows, all those comics had been working on the road for like 10, 15 years. Ray Romano, you know, b before they got their TV shows. And, and now, and uh, this is the lament of every aging comic. These kids today, you know, they don't have their chops. It's just different. It's not better or worse. It's just different. We have to end it. Um, selling a book. Uh, it's called um, Elect to Laugh. It's not the best book in the world, uh, but it's got a great cover, and it's only 10 bucks. And I got about eight of them, so if you want to buy it. Otherwise, you can go to Amazon and get it probably. I think if you're a Prime member, it's free, so yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. Hear it for Will Durs. Thank you guys so much. And uh, Will is here uh, selling copies of his book. Um, so thank you all for coming and thank you again, Will.